Okay, happy Monday evening. I appreciate everyone who joined me. Let me just share my screen first of all. And you should be now seeing um, my screen. If not, just give me a shout out. Before we get too, too far uh, started, I just wanted to make a quick announcement. I already posted an announcement about it today regarding some of the issues that we had with the uh, Blackboard during the towards the end of last week. So uh, if anyone missed a chance to submit work, uh, there is a little bit of an uh, extension available for that. Just in case uh, you missed anything and to make sure that you're able to get everything submitted. What we're doing today, we're continuing our discussion of uh, what we really started last week. And last week we kind of moved away from looking at life on its chemical level and looking at molecules, looking at cell organelles and looking at cells. And we moved our way to discuss a little bit more of a genetical uh, viewpoint on life. What is genetics and why does it matter? So uh, my hope is that today we continue that journey. And today we'll be talking about two chapters, chapters 12 and chapters 13. And um, while I was preparing for this session that we have tonight, uh, I was thinking a lot that to how much detail do we have time to go in the time that we have allocated for, for today. So I'm going to pick the key points that you really need to get away from the lecture material. And then you'll be able to fill in rest of the story. Or if it feels that I'm moving too fast with some of the lecture material, you'll be able to fill that in with the um, full lecture videos that I have provided to you here on Blackboard. Uh, but today's goal is really to kind of broad with the big strokes the most important themes that you should be able to take away and walk away as it relates to uh, this week's chapters. If at any point you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to just unmute yourself. I am having a little bit of harder time with the new layout to see the chat but I'll try to jump out of that every once in a while. And just so I don't forget, I think this is a really good time for us to also take the attendance. So if you could do me a favor and drop your name to the chat, I'll be able to then pull it from there and uh, make sure that, that uh, everyone gets an attendance for today. Perfect. I appreciate. And if at any stage uh, you realize that you didn't post your name, please do so. I see that there's a hand up. Uh, professor, I'm sorry to bother you, uh, but I was wondering if I could speak to you in private after class. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll, we'll do that after the class, if that's OK. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Absolutely. The same goes for anyone else. If you do want to talk one on one, uh, absolutely, I'll be around. I know that there's been few messages that I haven't had a chance to go through yet. If you've sent me a message, so that might be also uh, something to keep, on, to keep on. on. But any other questions? I think I'm starting to hear a little bit of echo. So if anyone has their mic on, if you can just unmute so, and no one gets totally confused. Uh, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to jump right to the chapter material, just because it is important that we get through the material, uh, even though it's not going to be able to cover everything. I want at least that you have a fairly uh, solid foundation on, on what's important from this chapter. So we'll talk about two separate chapters that I really think tie in quite nicely together. 
First, we'll have a look of a little bit of a history uh, and a person who has contributed greatly to our understanding of the genetics. And then we look at the general understanding of how genetic traits are inherited, how we can use this information uh, for, for our purposes. So, so kind of before we jump there, I think it's a good time for us to remind ourselves of some of the important concepts that we have covered. So, so far we have discussed uh, in a little bit of a detail about cells, how you can find the nucleus within the cell, and then we discussed about the chromosomes. We also discussed about the division of the cells and how chromosomes behave in the divisions of the cells when we're talking about uh, sex cells and when we're talking about irregular sex. We also have had a look of what the chromosomes are made of and seen that we can find our DNA, which was this double helix strand. And from the double helix strand, we notice that if there's a certain section of it that coded for a particular trait or particular protein, we call that section of a DNA a gene. So that should be a quick some of the key concepts. Like I mentioned, we also have looked at two different ways how cells can divide. And we saw that most of the time we would be talking about mitosis. And I believe that your lab, where you looked at the uh, cell division at the onion root tip, was largely focused on mitosis. So this is how cells divide most of the time, most uh, pretty much all cells in your body, uh, whether it's for facilitating your growth, uh, repair of tissues, regeneration, maintenance of tissues. So we constantly have cells that die and new cells that start their life. Uh, there's very few cells that would be the same from your birth until the day, very death. So we go through this process of constantly renewing cells. So that process was known as mitosis. What was important about mitosis was that we always had 100% of the genetic material in that cell division process. The kind of odd man out for the cell division process was the process of meiosis, which related to only production of two different kinds of cells that we can see in humans. That was egg cells and sperm cells. And we remember that a new individual was a summation of summing the genetic material from both egg and a sperm. So both of these could contribute only half of the genetic material Otherwise, we would end up with way too much genetic material, and that would become an issue. So the process of meiosis involved going through twice the cell division cycle uh, without duplicating the amount of uh, genetic material during that process so that we could end up with that 50% of the genetic material, which was known as a single N. 100% was known as 2N. So all of this should ring bells or remind you from things that we have discussed so far. One more theme that we have discussed so far, and we've kind of touched upon it, we haven't really dived into greater detail, was when we look at a chromosome structure. We saw that the chromosome was made of two chromatids that were held together by a centromere. And within each chromatid, we could find a locus that could be find, found on both chromatids. This locus contained the genetic information for a particular trait, and it could be that the genetic information on both uh, chromatids was the same for this particular trait. In that case, we talked about homozygous alleles. So I really refer to this genetic coding of, for a particular trait. Sometimes it happened that the genetic information, the coding for a particular trait at different at the same locus on at different chromatids. 
different. And in that case, we talked about heterozygous alleles. So I know that that's a lot of terminology, but it is important that you're kind of able to stay on top as we use those terms so that you're able to follow what we're moving on today. So I guess that the very first question that I would run into if I were with you in a classroom is that if we discuss that we've known all, we know now all this information that I've shared with you, but why does it really matter? Why do you need to know about this, how genes are passed from one to another to another individual? And our focus will be now on reproduction. So we'll be looking greatly how the genetic material is inherited from both mother and father and what sort of mixes might come. So it all comes down to that by knowing how these processes work, we're able to calculate different kinds of probabilities for different traits and how likely are we to find that trait in the offspring. Sometimes these can be harmless traits. Uh, someone might be just interested to know whether the uh, child is going to have a straight hairline or widow's peak hairline. Sometimes these can be very, very serious traits, such as uh, genetically passed uh, diseases, disorders, things that, that can really be have significant consequences for the individual. There are times when the uh, genes that are passed onwards might result in so severe, uh, so severe consequences for this offspring that either the pregnancy is not feasible, it will not be carried to the full term, or if the pregnancy is carried to the full term, the individual that results from that will have so significant genetic disorders that uh, they are at least word of being for the parents being prepared for, or sometimes it is in the best interest uh, to consider whether it, we will be successful of carrying that pregnancy through or not. Uh, there are many things to balance off, and this goes to the ethical field where I'm trying to stay a little bit away from on this course, but it goes into the discussions if giving birth to the child is going to be fatal for the mother, or if there's multiple children that the mother is carrying, and we know that there's a risk that the pregnancy will not res result into a full-term pregnancy for all of the individuals. Uh, how do we tackle those things? So really, rather than just being simple traits, which is what we will be focusing on this class and in our classes, these can be really, really big decisions as well. And being able to work out the probabilities, the likelihoods, really is going to be essential at that point. So what I was hoping to do with you is to share with you a video. And this video is something that I hope that you will take time to watch. We'll try to watch it together now. It's a little bit more complex uh, with the sound. I was hoping to get to the class a little earlier, but I didn't. So we get to try that the sound works. But uh, I want to start with that, because even though we have certain facts and certain things that you need to learn and get out of this class, to me, it's also really important that we consider why do you need to learn those facts. So bear with me as I set up the video. And we'll see if I'm able to do so. So you should be able to see a clip that I have here. And what I'm hoping to do is that you're also able to hear the audio. If the audio starts to echo, 
or if you're unable to hear the audio, what I'm going to do, I'm going to ask you to shout out and let me know because there's no point of you just watching uh, pictures of something. I do want you to hear the story as well. So if once we've started, you don't hear the audio, please, please, please let me know. Or if the audio is all muddled, let me know. I'm proud to be English, but my family have served and defended this country and been to war for this country. I'm, I'm really patriotic about Bangladesh. Well, I am, I am 100% Icelandic, yeah, definitely. This is a Kurdish wedding with my mom in the traditional Kurdish clothes. We're just proud black, so that's it. Yeah, I think we are probably the best country in the world, if I'm honest. Think about other countries and other nationalities in the world. Are there any that you you, you don't feel you, you get on with well or you, you won't like particularly? Germany. Yeah, I'm not a fan of the Germans. You might think that a little bit. Particularly India and Pakistan. And probably because of the whole, you know, the conflict. Because I have this side of me that's like, that hates the Turkish people. Not, not people, but the government. But French? No. Nah. We're just best, you know, it's just fact. I'm more important than you. I don't know you, but in my opinion, I am strong and I am, I am more important than a lot of people. How would you feel about taking a journey based on your DNA? Um, yeah, I feel very uh, intrigued. What could you possibly tell me that I don't know? So do you know how DNA works? So you get half from mum and half from dad. 50% from each of them. And they get 50% from their parents. And back and back and back. And all those little bits of your ancestor, they filter down to make you, you. I need you to spit in this tube for me. You spit up to the little black line. That's a lot of spit. <sighs> The story of you is in that tube. What's it going to tell me? It's going to be, oh yeah, you're French. And yeah. wait, your grandparents are French. And wait. 100% Bengali. Solid Iraqi. I'm Cuban. <laughs> going to tell me that I'm English. No, I've told you. Jay, can you come down and join us? I'm a little bit nervous, I have to say. So you're ready to find out your results? Will you read it out to us, please? Wow, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Oh, wow. Shit, did you make say that? <laughs> as like extremism in the world if people knew their heritage like that like who would be stupid enough to think of such thing as like a pure race in a way we're all kind of cousins in a broad sense mm. in a much more direct sense 
You have a cousin in this room. Mm -mm. Turn around and guess who it is. Wash? Yeah. What's that? Why don't you come down here and meet your cousin? So that was quite a video and I hope that it triggered at least some thoughts. Anyone feel comfortable enough to share uh, after that? What, what did come to your mind? Uh, what, what did it make you feel? And maybe in case if anyone has taken one of these DNA tests or tests such as Ancestry or there's many others that would tell you um, from whereabouts in the in the world your genetic in, uh, background is from. Does anyone feel comfortable enough or want to share about any of that? You can just unmute yourself and shout out. Well, if you didn't get a chance, we'll get a chance to talk about that a little later. Um, Normally, when I talk about this uh, with my students, some of the themes that come up, students are kind of realizing that really the information that we get from our family members, and let's say, for example, from the uh, parents and grandparents, there's a limit to how far we can go on that information and really to know the full story we would need to go much further back and that would require some sort of a family background research so there's a great interest in these uh, over-the-counter dna tests rather than just finding out where you're from there's a bunch of tests that also allow you to consider things such as for example, are you more genetically uh, likely to develop certain conditions such as allergies or some more serious conditions? So certainly having that information would be useful. Um, so that's probably kind of a good summary of the most common thoughts and most common impressions that I get when we start talking about this in the class. There is another side to the story, and I'm not trying to ruin anyone's excitement if you're uh, up, up and excited of finding out about your background, by all means do so. Uh, I do encourage you to, to be uh, knowledgeable of what you're signing up for and what sort of information you might find out, especially when you're looking for these tests that reveal you about your likelihood for certain conditions. Um, if these tests are administered over the counter, one of the concerns that some individuals have is to do with, do you get support if the results are not what you expect? We can even go to as basic questions as, which is one of the reasons why I stopped doing blood typing in my classroom. What if you find out that your parents are not who you think they are? Uh, 
uh, things like that. There's many questions that can come up from that. And really, I think that once we move on to that medical side of the spectrum, where we're dealing with uh, being likely to develop some serious conditions, having support and having that counseling available, someone who actually explains what the results mean for you becomes quite important. Another aspect that I brought up here on this slide on the screen is the question of ownership of DNA. So I'm not going to pretend that I've read through all of the terms and conditions of every single test out there. Uh, I'm simply referring to what some people have expressed as potential concern. Uh, potential concern would be if by taking one of these tests, you would agree for your DNA to be forwarded to other partners, for example, for medical research or for studies that you might not be aware of at this point. Um, really, if you think of it in a philosophical level, uh, we gather belongings, we gather uh, financial assets, but all of that can disappear in a blink of a moment. The only thing that you really own that's truly your own unique that no one else will ever own is your DNA, is your genetic makeup. So what if you sign off uh, from full ownership of that without realizing of doing so? And again, I'm not saying that all of the tests would do so. Uh, I'm saying that that's a one scenario and one thing that some individuals have expressed concerns over. Uh, I think of it just as purely pragmatic. If I really needed to build a DNA bank and I wanted to get that information, it would be really smart of me to find a way how I could get people want to give their DNA for me and potentially even pay a little bit of that. Uh, because once the DNA sample is made available for others, there's a lot of information that we might not have been screening for uh, ultimately and initially. And I'm not even saying that everyone comes from a bad place. What if later on something else, some other information is extracted from that DNA? That opens such as, well, should that be allowed to affect your insurance rates? If it's more likely that you're developing certain serious conditions, uh, should employers have an access to that if the uh, applicants voluntarily volunteer that is that information and so on. Uh, I'm going to be a little more careful than I would be in a class of the examples that I share. So I'm going to keep it a little bit more vague, but there is a certain country in the world that's not too unfamiliar to me, where a government made a decision uh, that, okay, we are a small country after the war, we need to get finances uh, to the country. And um, a certain medical company approached uh, with a proposition that if you let us collect a DNA sample from all of your citizens, we can actually do medication for your population. Uh, there are certain conditions that we know are more common with certain uh, geographical areas and with certain groups of individuals. So there might be an incentive in that sense. Um, one country has gone along with this and actually made the decision on behalf of their citizens that when you go to the doctor, we will collect that sample, whether it's from saliva, blood, or wherever, and slowly build a national DNA database. And uh, to who does the DNA database go? In this case, it went to an external um, pharmaceutical company. So people who did not have a choice of whether they're signing up for their DNA to be forwarded could have issues with that. Uh, there are many other aspects where we could take this conversation um, in terms of how much of your DNA are you willing to make available? And do you have a right to change your mind? For example, I used to work in forensic field and uh, we do collect DNA samples 
from either convicted or from suspects of serious crimes. Well, once we collect a DNA sample, it does remain in a database of either convicted or just individuals who were suspected of, of something. Uh, and that is one way how sometimes matches can be done, that we don't find a complete DNA match from the crime scene that would completely match with the samples that we've collected, but it's close enough that we can tell that it's going to be a family member of someone. Would that be an issue? Uh, where do we draw that line using the DNA information for good or for bad? How about if you were suspect of, it, of some serious crime, but you were never convicted and we found out that it wasn't you, but I've still collected that DNA sample. Should it be removed from that database? There, should there be a time limit to how long we maintain those samples? So there's a wealth of questions that one could ask as it relates to this topic. So I'm not going to open the can of worms and go into too much of a detail of that, but if anyone has any questions, I have sectioned a little bit of time from today to talk about those, so do not feel that I'm rushing you if you have questions. I might not know all of the answers from American legal standpoints, and a lot of these things are things that have changed since I practiced la last, especially in the forensic field. But if you do have questions, I'm, I'm happy to uh, chat about that, or if you have even just thoughts you want to share with the rest of the class. If not, we do get to explore this topic a little bit more in some of the activities that we have coming up on this course. But I really do think that it's important before we get to the nitty gritty of information that we also kind of acknowledge that there are challenges and potential questions that we might need to uh, consider. Well, at this point, if I don't see any questions, I don't hear any questions coming through, I'm simply going to make a move on with the actual lecture material as it relates to these two chapters that we're looking today. So I want to start by talking about a little bit of the history. How do we know what we know about DNA and how far back are we really looking when we're starting to understand uh, the history of our, our, our understanding of the DNA? So a certain gentleman, Gregor J. Mendel, becomes very important in this story. Uh, he was a monk and uh, I want to say in Austria um, and lived in a monastery back in 1800s. And a lot of the work that he did in the monastery is going to be what uh, a lot of the in basic information and basic foundational knowledge that we have about genetics builds up on. A uh, few things about Gregor Mendel that become a, a useful background information for you to know as we look at his work is that he truly was a scientist uh, who did an exemplary job of keeping careful records of the material uh, that he worked on. So uh, by having kept his carefully recorded uh, notes of experiments, he was able to go back and forth and find patterns that could have otherwise gone missing. The other thing is that, that you'll probably notice if you go into hard is that mathematics becomes important. And I know that mathematics and especially probability calculation and statistics is not necessarily everyone's idea of spending a fun Monday night, but having that background does become handy. And that was the case, especially with the Mendel. Uh, he had a strong background in mathematics, so he applied the laws of probability for working out these results that he found in these experiments. And this probability aspect relates to what we already discussed at the very beginning, that by knowing certain 
probabilities of genetic traits and how they are passed onwards, we're able to make predictions of not just the funny, harmless traits that get passed onwards, but also of serious conditions that might require hard decisions to be made by the parents. So back in the day in 18, hundreds, I believe in 1860s was when uh, Mendel conducted a lot of his uh, experiments that are, have, were groundbreaking or that we have them build our current knowledge of genetics. There was no knowledge about things such as DNA. So Gregor Mendel had to kind of invent language to explain things that we didn't yet know. So a lot of the time when you read his notes, you might notice that he talks about things such as minute particles that get passed onwards from parents to the children. And that was a really abstract idea. At that time, we of course didn't know that there are genes and how genes do get passed onwards from the parents to the offspring. So just based on these very basic experiments he did, he was not yet, he didn't have the vocabulary, we didn't have the knowledge of the DNA structure, genes in there, but he was able to conclude that there has to be something such as this minute particles and the, how these get passed onwards and how they get inherited uh, was important. Um, I mentioned that Gregor Mendel was a monk living in a monastery and uh, actually here is a picture of him with his peers. I've circled him in there. I have changed the questions and the homework questions in this, these chapters around quite a lot. So I'm gonna be honest that I don't remember exactly what I asked uh, from you. But at one point I did ask uh, students to identify him from this picture. So that's why sometimes joining to these classes might be useful. Uh, you might even see that he's holding this little plant on his hand. So he was even on the pictures uh, very dedicated to his research. So what do you do in a monastery in 1800s? Um, well, you grow peas and you study those peas and you try to understand life based on that. But let's take a step backwards a bit. And I just want to discuss in general the role of monasteries in uh, history and from the perspective of uh, sciences. So a lot of current universities in Europe that go back hundreds and hundreds of years have actually started from the foundations of the works, work done by monasteries. So monasteries were places where historical records, important documents were preserved, copied, so that they would pa be passed onwards to the future generations and a lot of uh, education of the public uh, also happened by the uh, monasteries. Uh, what you see there is the University of Glasgow where I studied back in Scotland, uh, hundreds and hundreds of years old reputable university, in fact the third oldest English-speaking university in the world. So um, I just included it as an example of the significant contribution that uh, monasteries did at that time for the uh, for the development of the sciences and uh, we'll see a little bit more examples of that as we become more familiar with Gregor Mendel's work today. Uh, what Mendel did, I mentioned he studied pea plants, so garden peas. Uh, and this is a fairly simple uh, plant, fairly uh, easy to grow, uh, has a, quite a short generation turnaround time. So we get from parent generation to the offspring and further and further on without having to wait 
too long. Uh, we saw when we first started talking about this, why humans might not be an ideal model organism since it takes so long for us to produce offspring and next generation and next generation so we could study genetic traits that get passed onwards. So carbon B makes an excellent model organism because of these and many other characteristics that they hold. Uh, what we end up finding is that normally in nature, carbon bees, of course, self-pollinate. So they take care of the pollination themselves by utilizing, uh, for example, bees and other, other insects to pass the pollen onwards. But what's interesting about garden peas that we can actually control the pollination process uh, by and if we start uh, applying certain techniques that Gregor Mendel became an expert of. So let's have a look of that a little bit. Um, so what we see here is a flower of a garden pea. And just like humans, uh, I'm not going to go into too much of a detail of the anatomy of the plants, but they do have female and male bits, if you wish. And in this case, we are removing the anthers by cutting them away with scissors. And if there are uh, flower doesn't have its own anthers, then all the pollen that's going to be pollinating that plant has to come from somewhere else. And by using paint brushes, Gregor Mendel was able to collect the pollen from a certain plant and pass it to another plant. So it was very well controlled that who were the parent plants for producing the offspring of these garden peas. So he was able to control all of these generations to see how certain traits are passed onwards. So that's probably the biggest take home message from this diagram. Uh, what I do want to say uh, is just a couple of things that we've already touched up on. Gregor Mendel used what we called true breeding varieties. So we already knew very well the genetic makeup of these uh, individual plants. He was very, very careful, not only on the execution of these experiments, but also recording them. And we discussed about the role of the mathematics in working out the probabilities of offspring. So he was able to tie in the math to the findings that he found. And by repeating these experiments time and time and time again, see how the certain laws started to apply. And of course, the big contribution that I mentioned already earlier on, these minute particles that we didn't know yet what they meant, but that we now know that were genes, they were one of the things that Gregor Mendel discovered through his work. So what I want to do, I want to look at some of the examples of what Gregor Mendel studied and what kind of traits he could start study. But I want to remind us from some of the kind of basic concepts that we have already discussed on this course. So on this course, we have already touched upon on the fact that some characteristics can be viewed at be, as being recessive and some characteristics as being dominant. So let's do just a quick reminder. So we discussed how um, we had different kinds of alleles. These were different forms of a gene. So we can have a form that codes for a straight hairline or for a widow peak. Well, of course, hairline is not something we're going to study with the pea garden peas, but we can study, for example, color of the pea pod that results. And what we end up finding is that for the color of the pea pod, we have the same dominant and recessive alleles that we find. If an allele is dominant, that means that whenever that allele is inherited, if it's inherited from both parents or even just from one parent, we will always see that trait that always is what we end up seeing. So dominant alleles are often, are, are, or are 
uh, symbolized in our shorthand when we're studying the genetics as capital letters. And even if there's just one dominant allele inherited from one of the parents, that is the trait we will see as a result of it all. So that was our dominant alleles. Let's have a look of the other alternative, which is, of course, our recessive alleles. Recessive alleles are less common to find because to see the recessive allele in the offspring, you need to inherit an allele or see a recessive trait in the offspring. You need to inherit recessive allele from both parents. So both parents need to give this recessive allele so that the individual will show that characteristic. That's why we don't often see that as commonly in the nature. Um, that's why we also mark it on our shorthand with lowercase letters. So it's not quite as common one to see. Uh, it is there and it can be onwards, but you need to inherit that from both parents. So these terms should be something that rings at least a little bit of bells based on what we've discussed earlier on this course. Now, let's have a look of seven different traits that Gregor Mendel studied. And this is not to say that there wouldn't be other traits. These are just the seven traits that I picked up when I was preparing this class for us and that have clear, recessive, and dominant uh, versions of those traits. So, for example, you can have for a garden pea, a plant that grows very tall, that's more common, that's the dominant trait, or if you inherit the recessive allele from both parents, you can also have a garden pea plant that grows shorter. The pot shape can be either inflated or constricted. Uh, the seed shape, we can have round or wrinkled. Uh, seed color, yellow or green, and so on and so on. And you'll notice how certain traits are more likely to become the ones that we see because these are dominant. So getting a gene or getting inheriting an allele, even from one of the parents for this, will result that the offspring will appear as, as these dominant traits. For us to see these recessive traits, uh, the offspring would need to inherit the recessive allele from both parents. So it's going to be much rarer to see uh, yellow pods or white flowers or flowers that are located terminally to the plants, uh, plant or so on and so on. So I hope that that helps you to see that there's a lot that we could study. However, in the interest of time and kind of keeping our mind without getting overwhelmed, we will focus only on one of the characteristics. Before we jump into this, this is a into talking about the alleles. This is a question I sometimes get from the, uh, students that is it possible that, for example, a black couple has a wild white child or alternatively that a white couple ends up with a black child the answer is it is all about the genetics the odds of that are not very like but it doesn't mean that there wouldn't be some odds for that so uh, genetics really requires you to understand that probabilities are just that it's not likely to happen however uh, we gamble and hope to play against the probabilities all the time. For example, when we play lottery, the probability of you winning the lottery is small, but still many people play it because what if you get that one in a million chance and win that jackpot? So basically, that's what genetics is all about. We try to get that jackpot of that ideal combination of genetics. And I'm not by any means saying that uh, it would be dependent on the skin color, uh, what might make you genetically optimal or genetically lucky. You have 
trait that gives you greater chance of survival. And I think one of the good examples that we see when we talk about this in relation to evolution is the giraffes having developed long necks because the giraffes who had long necks were able to reach more nutrition from the tree. So that's how these individuals then got more resources, they became more attractive mates, and those genes were passed onwards. So they, that's how evolution works. Uh, I really added this picture just because I got um, found an old picture of my kitten. So uh, we could study, for example, traits that get passed uh, in breeding of cats, dogs, many other animals. And I used to do a little bit of, uh, I was a little involved with the breeding of cats. There are certain genetic characteristics that we want to pass onwards and certain that we don't. So again, having the basic understanding, uh, I think is useful for anyone, regardless whatever you end up doing in your life. There's two more terms that I really want us to talk about kind of as a foundation for what we need to understand. And these are going to be the terms genotype and phenotype. So uh, even though something is encoded in the genetics, doesn't mean that we will always see that. So let's have a look at that a little bit. So whenever we talk about genotype, we talk about the genetic makeup of that individual. So genes determine what kind of traits we will see in an individual. So it's there's always a genetic foundation behind the traits that get passed onwards genetically from one generation to another. However, even though certain genes might be passed from parents to offspring, it's not always that we see all of those genes. What we see, what are the observable characteristics are known as phenotype. For example, let's keep it simple and think of our recessive traits, a recessive alleles. You will not see that phenotype that's recessive unless the alleles for that recessive trait are inherited from both parents. So even though you might be carrying that recessive allele, your phenotype will not disclose that unless you inherited it from both parents. So genotype contains the full story. Phenotype is what we see. So those two terms, I hope they make sense. If not, I'm happy to revisit with them, uh, those with you. And again, I'm going to be honest and say that there's a lot of information to go through. So we're just doing a basic level overview of the topics today. And for more of the full story, I definitely refer you to the lecture video that I have provided. So now that we have had a look of the terms genotype and phenotype, it's a good time for us to come to the really application of these probabilities that we talked about. So let's have a look of a concept known as Punnett square. At this time, I do not want you to worry at all about what you see here on the lower bottom corner of the screen. I simply want us to focus on the definition. So Punnett square is a tool that we use when we study genetics. And this tool is basically a way of mapping out all possible combinations of egg and sperm, the genetics carried by the egg and the sperm for a particular trait, and all possible combinations of what the offspring, the future children of these two might inherit. So what we see here, I've separated the female genetic traits, uh, the alleles for, for a certain characteristic, male, uh, what the male carries of these alleles for a particular characteristic. What we see is that we have two options, that the female, of course, carries two alleles, so it can be either one of these that she passes onwards to the offspring. In this case, it would, could be capital G or lowercase g. Same goes for the 
male. So male can pass the capital G or lowercase g. We do not know. The chances are 50-50 that which one, each one of these will pass onwards, which one the mother will pass onwards and which one the father will pass onwards. Because we don't know which one it will be, we will list on a Punnett square all possible options. Well, the all possible options are listed for both mother and father, and that gives us a graph where we have four possible genotypic, uh, four possible combinations uh, when we look at the, let's look, start with the genotype uh, of what might come up. And Punnett squares work very simply. There's very little secret to them. So let's have a look how we are going to predict the first possible outcome when we assume that the mother will pass the allele, that's capital G, and father will pass the allele, that's a capital G. Well, we draw these alleles to this box and we get capital G, capital G for the offspring's genetic makeup for this particular trait. Well, we know that this particular trait is going to be the color of the pea pod. And we found out that the green color is more dominant in the offspring. So if there is even just one capital G, the offspring will show up green pods. Only time that we will see yellow pods is if we inherit the allele for yellow from both parents. So let's have a look when we see that. Again, let's look at the female, but this time consider the option that the female passes lowercase g, so the allele for the yellow pod, but we're still going to work on this assumption that the father will pass uppercase g. So what comes out of that? We would get an offspring with alleles capital G, lowercase g, but because even presence of just one dominant allele resulted the dominant characteristic to be seen. Well, as a result, we will still see the green color on the pea pod. Let's have a look of the two of the possible remaining options that we can be left with. Mother passing capital G and father passing lowercase g. We get a capital G, lowercase g, Again, just because it's even just one dominant allele, the outcome, the phenotype will be green pea pod. So the only time in this diagram that we just produced that we will see the recessive allele also as a phenotype is going to be when both mother and father pass the lowercase g to their offspring. If that's the case, now that we have the recessive allele from both parents, we will see the yellow pea pod as a phenotype. So now what becomes important is that we remember those terms phenotype and genotype. And we will come to visit this concept of phenotype and genotype in just a second. I do want to remind you, though, that we are now looking of generations of passing genes onwards. So, so we have looked at only the original parents and then the first generation of offspring. So the original parents were the mother and father and they could each donate one or another of these alleles. The offspring was the first generation. We call that F1 generation, and we mapped out all possible combinations that the offspring might end up. But we don't have to finish there. And a lot of the time when we're studying genetics, we actually look at also grandchildren. And the reason why we look at the grandchildren, so the children of 
the first generation is that certain traits we need to have so many generations to go through to see certain for example recessive alleles starting to show up remember we didn't see recessive alleles unless we inherited that from both parents so it might be that we need few different generations before we start to see those traits so going back to what we saw earlier on about this Punnett square, about the alleles inherited from parents and alleles that we got for the offspring. And then we also looked at the, uh, we had discussed the genotype of the offspring and the phenotype of the offspring. So let's have a look of that a little bit. So what we did as the first step, we mapped out the genotype of the offspring. So the genotype was this either capital, capital G, capital lowercase g, and you saw that we had two of those, or then lowercase, lowercase g. So the genotypic options that we had, we actually had three different combinations that we could end up with. Even though we don't see other than just two phenotypes, there are three different genotypes that we might see. So that's something that's worthwhile to notice. And of course, we did talk about the phenotypes. That was the color that we could see. And we noticed that the color only time that we saw the recessive trait was when we inherited the alleles from both parents for that color. So that's how these Punnett squares work. We have kept it simple and just looked at one single trait, one single generation of crossings. We could make it more complex. And what I've done here, I found a really nice uh, calculator online. And if I haven't, I'm happy to share a link to this calculator that shows the size of the uh, Punnett square, once we start studying instead of just one trait, two traits at the same time. Well, as you see, the Punnett square size grows. Now we're looking at two different traits. We could be looking, for example, the color of the pea pod, but also the shape of the pea. And as you notice, the size of the Punnett square grew drastically when we introduced second characteristic. If we introduce three different characteristics, the size of the Punnett square grows already significantly large. Uh, so we really rarely go for a multifactorial uh, or multiple traits at the same time that I'm asking you to study. Uh, we keep it simple on this course, but I want you to know that nothing prevents us from comparing three different traits at the same time. The workload will be just greater and there will be more possible outcomes, both for genotype and phenotype. Another important concept that I do want to talk about today a little bit before we wrap up is the concept of a pedigree. And some of you might have heard about the dog food pedigree. We're not talking about dog food. We're talking about a chart that we use to show how certain one particular genetic trait is passed through a family's history. So we're looking at family trees and we're looking how that particular genetic trait is passed onwards in that family tree. And we can do that to go backwards in our family. So we can look what your parents, what your grandparents likely had, or we can do it to go onwards to predict what would be if you had a child with someone whose genetic trait we know for that particular characteristic. So these pedigrees often look something like what you see here on the right bottom corner. So we see a bunch of boxes and circles and we see a bunch of lines that connect these boxes and circles. And each element on this pedigree carries important information. So let's have a look of that a little bit. And let's keep it simple. Let's start first with squares, which symbolize males, and circles, which symbolize females. 
So this is just something that has become a standard practice as we do pedigrees. I do realize that these days families are very different. We don't need to have same-sex parents. But for the purposes of studying genetic inheritance, of characteristics, we will still assume that there is a male and a female. A male contributes 50% and a female contributes 50%. So we're simply talking about the biology. We're not talking about uh, family dynamics. We're not talking about parenthood. We're simply talking about the biological aspect. Another thing that you'll see in the pedigrees is that we have some circles and some squares that are shaded. If it's shaded, it means that this individual would be expressing the particular disorder that we're studying. If the box or a circle does not include any shading, it normally means that that individual would not have that particular disorder that we're studying. So what you're starting to see here that I'm moving away from traits and I'm starting to talk about disorders. And like I said, sometimes these disorders can be very, very severe. So uh, it might be that parents want in a hospital before having a child to map out all possible outcomes. Will Is there a chance that their child will get a disorder that will be problematic or that will cause extra challenges. Another thing that we see in a pedigree is that there's a bunch of lines. Whenever we have a horizontal line, that means that this couple will have a chill child. They don't always have a child, but they're still a union. This couple is a pair in a sense of being parents in a genetical sense. So you'll notice, again, we're simply talking about biology. We're not talking about family dynamics. We're not making any assumptions of this. But from a biological standpoint, still at the moment, we assume that uh, there will be a male and a female that are the parents. Because we needed a male and female to donate, each one of them donating 50% of the genetic material. We'll also see on pedigrees vertical lines, so these lines that go downwards. These lines tell us that we have now a child of this couple. And of course, a couple can have one, two, three, or even more children. So we would simply map out all of those possible options of, of how many uh, child they would have when we're doing these pedigrees. So really, reading pedigrees is not as daunting as it might seem initially when you see this diagram. You just simply need to break it down into smaller elements and analyze each one of these. Are we looking of a male or a female? Are we looking of a square or a circle? Are we looking of an individual with a disorder or without a disorder? Is the circle or square shaded or not? Are we looking of a couple? or are we looking at their child? child? So all of those uh, will help you to read these pedigrees. And pedigrees can help us to work out many different kinds of disorders. We can have autosomal recessive disorders. We can have autosomal dominant disorders. And we can have also sex-linked uh, recessive and dominant disorders. What I'm showing here with this raffle machine is really just trying to emphasize this, that basically all from a genetical standpoint, all that reproduction is, is trying to hit that genetic jackpot where your child has all those most desirable characteristics which allow that child to be most successful in the environment where they're born. And if they're very successful, they're probably going to be able to feed themselves, take care of themselves, grow to be big and strong. And these big and strong successful individuals are usually more desirable mates in a, a simply biological sense. And the genes of these individuals get passed on. 
questions. I used to ask my students, uh, and this is going a little bit off the topic of what we're talking, but still tying, tying into that, that what is a really sign from an evolutionary standpoint that you've been a success? And really the sign of evolutionary success is that you have grandchildren, what we see sometimes is that, that some species that even shouldn't be mating, shouldn't be producing offspring, can actually make a viable child, even though they shouldn't. But that viable child will always be infertile. So really what you want to see if you consider the success in an evolutionary sense is that you see your genes being passed on. But that's only evolutionary point of view. I'm not saying that that's the only point of view, and I'm not saying that that's the most important point of view. I'm simply talking as it relates to our lecture material. So you at this point of the chapter ask that, so what? We've made this very complex. We've looked at all sorts of characteristics, how they are inherited, and how there might be all sorts of things going on. Why do I care? So your lecture material, which I'm leaving for you to study independently, the full lecture videos, uh, has multiple examples of so what. So what you're not see seeing here, this is not a family of serfs. There is actually a genetic disorder which causes an individual's uh, blood to be affected so that the Blood causes these individuals to appear bluish in color. That's simply genetics. And uh, there's many, many cases of that documented. And I talk about that a little bit in the full lecture videos. I've mentioned so far that there are medical conditions, uh, disorders that are also genetically inherited, such as muscular dystrophy, uh, sickle cell anemia, uh, issues that can affect also your urine. And uh, some of you might have heard about the star family and how uh, towards the last generation of the czars in uh, Russia, uh, they were executed and the body is buried and then there was this whole trying to figure out that was Anastasia really related to the Tsar family was, or were, were they not? And by simply using the genetics, we're able to work that out. I think that back in, I want to say 90s, the Disney did an animation about Anastasia and the story of that. So if you're the same generation, you might remember that as well. So that all concludes everything that I wanted to discuss in terms of uh, the basics of uh, genetics, basics of the work by Gregor Mendel. How do you use pedigrees and how do you use Punnett squares to understand how certain traits, uh, certain characteristics are passed onwards to the offspring? I know that that was a lot of material in a short amount of time. Uh, I hope that you found it useful. Uh, if you have any empty gaps, you're missing any information, I really refer you back to have a look of those full lecture videos. But uh, having said that, if you don't mind and you just drop me your uh, name to the chat. I can give you an attendance for the full session. I know we ran a little bit over time. So what I do, I always give extra credit for anyone who stuck through the entire time. And that's it for this session. I will be here around to answer any questions. But if you don't have any questions, it for today. Uh, remember, I did share an announcement about that, that I believe that on the coming Thursday, it's Veterans Day, then we have one normal week, and after that week, we get to the Thanksgiving break. So uh, make sure that you stay on top of those that when you have co college and when you don't, those days don't really affect us since we meet on Mondays and Wednesdays, but for other classes. I thank you for joining me tonight, and I hope you have a very good rest of the night, and I'll stick around for any questions, but if you don't have questions, this is it for today. Have a good rest of the night. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you so much. And what I'll do, I'll just record so we can tackle any questions if there's something that you don't want shared with the rest of the class.